Well, good morning. I'd like to welcome any visitors as well. We're grateful to have you with us this morning as we worship. It's Resurrection Sunday. We're going to celebrate this blessed truth that Jesus was dead in a tomb, uh, embalmed and prepared for burial, and on the third day, as prophesied and promised, he arose the victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. Hallelujah, Christ arose. So this is the foundational doctrine and reality of the Christian faith. And what I would like to do this morning is I want to consider two questions concerning the resurrection of Jesus Christ. First, did it, did it really happen? And then secondly, if it did, what does that mean for me as I sit here this morning? And so I hope to answer these questions, and I would ask that you come with me and give um, consideration to these arguments um, that I'll give concerning the resurrection. Uh, try not to just say, hey, I'm scientific, it could have never happened. Um, I, I, I won't even consider it. I want you to come with me this morning and think through this. Let's journey together in the most important truth, I believe, in the history of the world. If Jesus, being fully God and fully man, died, and then he rose from the dead on the third day, who it now says in Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, and that he's coming again at the end of the age to judge the living and the dead and to set up his eternal kingdom forever. So what you do with Jesus will affect your whole eternal destiny. And so I can't use hyperbole in that this is the most important truth that you will ever consider. And so I want to pull up on the screen. If I don't know if you guys got it or not. I tried to get it set up. Uh, this is a big stretch for Pastor Murphy. He doesn't do things like this. Um, do, do we have my little meme to just put up there? No? Okay. You guys would have loved it. It's, it's, a, it's a hotel, and this lady's at the front desk, and the guy's calling, and he says, hey, uh, I'd like a wake-up call. And she says, sure, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God <laughs> is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So I'm going to love you this morning. I want to give you a wake-up call and just share the beautiful truth of God's Word with you about the gospel. So let's go to God and, and pray and ask His blessing on this time. Father, we come before you, and we rejoice, and uh, a Savior who left glory where he was worshiped and praised in perfect fellowship with you. And he came by way of a virgin's womb into a manger. And he entered this world to live the perfect life that you require of your people. And he died the death that our sins deserve for transgressing your law. God, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you that he died in our place and he was buried on the third day, he arose, and that was your declaration to the world that he is the saving one. He is the one who can save your people from their sins. God, let this beautiful, marvelous, glorious message fall on every heart this morning. Meet us in a beautiful way, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, if you'll turn to Matthew chapter 28. We're going to look at the resur resurrection from Matthew's account. And as you turn there, I just want to set a little context. Jesus was born into the world in which the Holy Spirit put a holy embryo inside of Mary. He came and he, he fulfilled the Scriptures thousands of years that were written before that. That he would come and be a descendant of David. He'd be fully man and that he would also come and be fully God. He was the God-man to represent both parties to bring them back together. He came into the world and he preached the kingdom of God. And he manifested himself as God by raising the dead and healing storms, uh, healing people and quieting storms. And he, he showed that he was the son of God. And his own people that waited for him, the religious people of the day, the Pharisees, had him put to death by a Roman government. They put him to death on a cross. Again, that was told 700 years before in Isaiah. In Matthew 28, 5, we will look this morning, the angel said to the women at the tomb, do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who has been crucified. And my question as we begin this morning, why was the Son of God crucified? And I just want to look at five things regarding the crucifixion and then we'll move to the resurrection. The crucifixion of Jesus was a very public event. 
This did not happen in a corner. In Acts 26, 26, Paul said, For the king knows about these matters, and I speak to him with confidence since I'm persuaded that none of these things have escaped his notice, for this has been not done in a corner. And then in Luke 24, 13, Jesus is walking with the, after his uh, death, he's walking with the two men on the road to Emmaus, and they don't know it's Jesus yet. And they, the two of them were going to the village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were conversing with each other about these things which had taken place. And it came about that while they were conversing and discussing, Jesus himself approached, and he began traveling with these two men. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are these words that you're exchanging with one another as you're walking? And they stood still looking sad. And one of them named Cleopas answered and said, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened here in these days? Are you the only person who hasn't heard? And he said to them, what things? And they said the things about Jesus, the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and in word in the sight of God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him up to the sentence of death, and they crucified him. All the religious and secular leaders were involved in this. Secular historians of the earliest centuries treated the death of Jesus as a historical fact. <coughs> Secondly, the crucifixion was painful. In the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, the suffering of death by crucifixion was intense especially in hot climates. The swelling about the rough nails and the torn lacerated tendons and nerves caused excruciating agony. The arteries of the head and stomach were surcharged with blood and a, terif uh, a terrific throbbing headache would ensue. The mind was confused and filled with anxiety and dread foreboding. The victim of crucifixion literally died a thousand deaths. The sufferings were so frightful that Josephus wrote that even among the raging passions of war, pity was sometimes excited. The length of this agony was wholly determined by the constitution of the victim, but death rarely ensued before 36 hours had elapsed. Death was sometimes hastened by the breaking of legs of the victims by a hard blow delivered under the armpit before the crucifixion. And so it was an excruciating way to die. Thirdly, the crucifixion, I want you to catch this, it was planned by God. In Matthew 17, 22, while they were gathering together in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he'll be raised on the third day, and they were deeply grieved. In Acts 4.27, for truly in this city they were gathered together against thy holy servant Jesus, whom thou, God, the Father, did anoint. Both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever thy hand and thy purpose predestined to occur." The death of Christ was not a historical fluke or an accident. It was planned by God before the foundation of the world. In fact, it was why the world was created. Fourthly, the crucifixion of Jesus was punishment for sin. And I want you to hear this. He was the only one who had no sin. And so the punishment for sin was not his own. He left heaven and came into this world what could have possibly caused Christ to leave heaven to come die on a cross? In Matthew 1, 21, an angel appears and says, She's going to bear a son, Mary, and you shall call his name Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. He's going to come and save you from your sin. And as Sean read this morning in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, He, God made him Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So Jesus will go up on a cross and bear the punishment of God for our sins. We serve a God who is holy and just. He's so pure and beautiful, he can't look upon sin. He has to punish it to be true to who he is. Death is the result of sin. When we die, there's an eternal punishment for sin. And so there was nothing that we could do to get this condemnation off of us. We can't work and be good and clean ourselves up. All we can do is die. And then comes the sweet sound of the gospel. And can it be that God would send a substitute? This is Christianity. I'm going to send a substitute 
who will stand in your place and go up on a cross and bear the wrath of God for your sins. That substitute would be the only begotten Son of God. He would bear the, son, the punishment for my sin. My sins were put on Him, and He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all. He spared not His Son so He could spare you from the punishment your sins deserve. Jesus received wrath without mercy so that you could receive mercy without wrath. What kind of love is this? It is unparalleled. The hymn writer said, What wondrous love is this, O my soul? What wondrous love is this who caused the Lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse for my soul? Jesus said one might even die for a righteous man, but one that he'll die for sinners. Isaiah 53, 5, he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray, and each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall upon him. And so the question is, how do I know that he bore it? How do I know that God is satisfied with what Christ did on that cross? Because God the Father told us. And on Easter, he raised them up from the dead to say this sacrifice was sufficient. This sacrifice paid the price for your sins. And now they can be separated as far as the east is from the west. And God says, I'll remember them no more. That's why we celebrate the resurrection. God is saying, it's finished. It's enough. He satisfied all my wrath against sin. It worked. It was effective. So let's go through Matthew 28. Let's move to the resurrection. It's hard to talk about a resurrection without a crucifixion. Verse 1. <laughs> After the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And so the Sabbath started sundown Friday night to sundown Saturday night. Jesus died on Friday He's buried in the grave Saturday, and Sunday, he arose on the third day, just like he said. This was the dawn of the first day of the week, and on that day, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary come to the grave of Joseph of Arimathea, and look at Matthew 27, 55. Many women were there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee while ministering to him. Among them was Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. And so these ladies were there at the crucifixion, and, and they've been following Jesus since the cross. And they were loyal, and they were faithful. They stood and watched the crucifixion. Friday, when they took the body down, they came and they brought embalming spices to prepare the body. And this morning, they're going back to the grave to put on more spices. <clears throat> In verse 2, Behold, a severe earthquake had occurred. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. So this severe earthquake, there was another when he died, the same thing, a severe earthquake. And an angel of the Lord came from heaven and he rolled that stone away that was covering it. And then in verse 3, his appearance was like lightning and his clothing was as white as snow. There's just purity and brilliance to this angel. In verse 4, the guards shake for fear of him, and they became like dead men. They're like knocked into a coma, and they're passed out. And then in verse 5, the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. The women are afraid as well. And Jesus looks and says, Stop fearing. You're looking for Jesus. He's been crucified. And in verse 6, He's not here. For he has risen, just as he said. Come see the place where he was lying. He, he has been raised from the dead, just like he said he would. And then in verse 7, go quickly. Go tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he's going ahead of you into Galilee. And there you're going to see him. Behold, I have told you. Go tell the disciples. They're, they're terrified and they're hiding in a room. 
There, there's fear that the soldiers are going to come and they're going to get them now and next. So they're, they're trembling. They're not expecting a resurrection. They're expecting their in, imminent death. Their hopes and dreams in Jesus Christ conquering all the, their enemies and throwing them down has been dashed. It's, it's, it's all crashing in on them and they're terrified. And now in verse 8, these ladies left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to the disciples. So another motion is coming on. They, they have fear and now there's a, a growing joy that he's risen. He, he isn't dead. He, he's alive. So there, there's this fear and reverence and there's this uh, growing up joy. And then in verse 9, behold, Jesus met them and he greeted them. And they came up and they took hold of his feet and they worshiped him. And Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee and there they will see me. And so follow the flow as there's sadness, there's fear, there's joy, and now there's worship. This is what the resurrection does to a heart. And then Jesus, for the first time, he, he, he doesn't call them friends. He calls them brothers. And so now in the resurrection, you're, you're my brothers and we're family and you're brought into relationship. And so here is the gospel. And so my first question in our outline then is, did it really happen? Did it really happen? And there's so many reasons given today of why it could not happen. I was reading a commentator who came up with like seven different excuses through the history. One was called the swoon method. And they said he, he didn't die on that cross. He just kind of was in shock and he just kind of swooned into a coma. And then he woke up and that's why he came out. A lot of problems with that. These are experts at crucifixion and stabbing him and, and the water coming out. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a difficult explanation. Uh, the second is he was never there. Uh, there was a, a city dump, Gehenna, and they would throw the bodies into that. And they said he never really went in the tomb. He was just put in Gehenna. And, and the whole thing is these guards are guarding the tomb and all of that. That's a hard one to believe that he was in Gehenna. The other is it was a hallucination. They wanted him alive so bad. It just, they hallucinated it. The other was a seance, a, a medium conjured up the spirit of dead Jesus. And that's what they were seeing. One said it was a mistaken identity. It was just an impersonator and it wasn't really Jesus. The atheist, one witness, said uh, it, it was just one person who was insane that started saying that and later on we're going to see that he appeared to 500 people at once. So really there's only one lie that could have worked and that would be that the apostles came and stole the body. If you'll look with me in verses 11, <clears throat> now, while they were there on their way, some of the guards came into the city and reported to the chief priest all that had happened. Okay. Test, test, yes. I've been told I have a draining personality. <clears throat> Verse 12, and when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers and said, you're to say his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this should come to the governor's ears, we'll win him over and keep you out of trouble. And so they took the money and they did as they had been instructed. And this story was widely spread among the Jews and it is to this day. So this was the lie that they decided to go with. And if you'll go back to Matthew 27, I want to read to you verse 62 after the crucifixion. On the next day, the day after the preparation of the body, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that when he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I'm going to rise again. Therefore, give orders to the, uh, for the grave to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal him away and say to the people, he's risen from the dead, and the last deception will be worse than the first. 
And Pilate said, you got the guard, go make it as secure as you know how. And they were very good at securing these things. And they went and they made the grave secure. And along with the guard, they set a seal on the stone. And so this is the lie that they decided to go with. This was the lie still being propagated 30 years when Matthew is writing this gospel. John died in 90 AD. He was the last of the apostles to die. So that had been 60 years of this being propagated. And I was reading this week, some of you remember Chuck Colson, who was a part of Watergate, and he went to prison, and then he ended up getting saved and started prison fellowship, and, and thousands and hundreds of thousands of people have been saved by him going to prison and getting saved. But listen to what he said. He said, I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. He said Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? He said, absolutely impossible. These guys for 60 years, they're hiding in a room, terrified that they're going to die. And all of a sudden, they come running out. And all of them but John die a martyr's death for this supposed lie. They would not recant that Jesus was alive and he's the Savior of the world. James was the half-brother of Jesus. That'd be a tough way to grow up. And he didn't believe. There are times where it says he did not believe in his brother. And then he comes to faith, and we read in James that, that he uh, would, would have his brains bashed out and be martyred than not say that Jesus Christ is Lord. So he comes to the, this, my brother is the Lord, and I'll have my head beat in because I cannot deny that he's the Lord of Lord and the King of Kings. So who would die for a lie? Jesus makes 10 appearances to people, 500 at one time in Galilee. He spends 40 days with the apostles speaking of the kingdom and showing them proofs. Some of them doubted at first, even Thomas, doubting Thomas. He convinced him, put your fingers in my holes. They never doubted again, and they gave their lives for the spread of this gospel, and they were willing to die for it. They filled Jerusalem with this teaching that he was crucified and he's risen. In Acts, 20,000 people come to believe. And these people, these men were poor, uneducated, not eloquent or orators. The power was their faith. And they had seen Jesus. And they knew that there was salvation in no other name. He's alive. And they would die for that reality. Maybe a few other thoughts. In verse 8. <laughs> And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to the disciples. So who were the first witnesses of the resurrection? Uh, it was the women. And the Marys came. And they're the, in all four Gospels, they're the first witnesses. And, they're, and, and in that day when this was written, they weren't even full citizens at the time. The, the women couldn't give testimony in court. Not saying that's right. But what would be your motivation to write that? To, to have them be the first witnesses of the resurrection. I mean, what, if, if, they're, if they couldn't even testify in court, don't you think you'd want to keep that quiet if you're trying to start a false movement? Except for one reason. It's how it happened. Unless that is exactly how it happened. These women were still alive at the writing, and they were the firsthand witnesses that there was an empty tomb, and Mary came and saw it empty. In verse 17, it still says some of them worshipped him and some still doubted. Um, if, if you were making this up, you'd leave that out. That's not how fairy tales and legends get started. Why were they doubting? Because they had no place for a resurrection until the end of the world. And their doubts were just as strong as some of yours might be this morning. But something came and changed and blew it away, and it was seeing the resurrected Christ. And then probably the most important thing that I know, their lives were radically changed by what they saw. Uneducated fishermen now changing the world that Jesus died on a cross and has been raised 
and in him there's salvation for your sins. He's alive. And they were eyewitnesses of the empty tomb. And now the the full courage and power of being transformed and transforming the world. And the conclusion is that the one who died on that tree for our sins, the just for the unjust, he breathed his last as a sacrifice for sin. He died and he was buried. And on the third day, just as he said, he was raised. And that sent those men into the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And probably for my own heart, I've tasted the power for me. I remember my mom, so sweet, cutest thing I've ever, ever known. Um, she was in a, a church and she had a, a friend whose son was addicted to drugs. And she said, I told him to go to your church because your church can help people like that. And what she's getting at is the power of the gospel changes lives. And since I've been a pastor, I've, I've watched prostitutes, I've watched drug addicts, I've watched narcissists, and I've watched really religious, moral, squeaky clean people get changed, saved, transformed, and the peace of God begin to fill them and transform them. And so for me, the the power of the gospel, I've tasted it in my own life. A lover of self, a lover of sin, and this meeting this resurrected Jesus is changing everything about me. And I have fellowship with him and I have communion and he's transforming and changing. And so what I offer to you is the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ for the pain, the hurt, the sin that brings broken lives. Jesus Christ is a healer. And I offer this beautiful gospel, salvation from sin and all of its consequences of this risen Christ this morning. Last thing, and I'm gonna let you go. The million dollar question is, did it happen? And yes. And secondly, what should that mean to you then as you sit here this morning? And there's a lot of things that it should mean. And so I'm just going to stay in our text and I'm going to answer a few of those things from our text. At the end of this chapter, Matthew 28, 20, Jesus says, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. And so I just want you to see first in in history is that all authority has been given to me. I now am the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. I'm over all of history. And so what that means to you is this risen one who's now the Lord of the church and the Lord of our lives, he's in charge of all of history. He's over your lives. In Romans 8, 28, it says, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and have been called according to his purpose. The next verse is he's working now to conform you to the image of Jesus Christ. So the risen Christ is over your life. And he can take everything and begin using it and working it for your conformity to Christ, for your eternal good. So what does it mean to you? The the God of the universe is for you through this gospel in history. Second, he's present in the gospel. He's present now as you're going to go out and I'll be with you always. In Ephesians 2, 17, it says, Jesus came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who are near. And I remember preaching through that. The question is, when did Christ preach the gospel in Ephesus? The answer is he didn't. But anyone who preaches this gospel, Christ is there. He's going to attend the preaching of that gospel. He's here. He's, he's, if you hear his voice this morning, don't harden your heart. Repent. Bow to him. My sheep hear my voice, Jesus said. In Luke 24, when he was talking to those men on Emmaus and explaining the scriptures, they said, were not our hearts burning when he opened up the scriptures? And when he comes to the gospel, you start hearing it and he's moving and he's working in your heart. And so through this gospel, you can know Christ. You can know his love and his presence. He can be as real to you as I'm sitting here this morning. His spirit will manifest his presence to you. Christ is present He's changed us. He transforms us. He's present in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And thirdly, he's with you in community. 
He says, I will be with you always as you go fulfill the great commission to make disciples of all the nations. I'll be with you. This is big. I will be with you. In the English, we, we just, we don't translate this word well. <clears throat> is it, is you singular or plural? And then when you say you, you don't know. And, and what I love about the South, they get this. Y'all. You, that's, and, and this, it should have said, I'll be with y'all until the end of the age. I am with you in community as a church as you go to make disciples of Jesus Christ that believe in him, baptize, learn all that he taught, and become like him and follow him. I'll be with you. The church has the presence of Christ and all of our gifts together in love and unity are helping each other grow in the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So when someone says to me, why should I go to church? I don't need church. You need church. This is where the power of Jesus is transforming lives and changing them as we come together. I'll be with you always till the end of the age. I, I invite you into the local body where the power of God is working and changing lives and we're taking this gospel to the ends of the earth. And fourth, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. And guys, this is where all of history has been moving. This is what I want you to see, that this, this is why we need a wake-up call. This is about eternal life. And the Bible ends with eternal death and eternal life. There's only two places. And what this is offering is eternal life. The eternal resurrection at the end of history. What Jesus purchased for us on the cross is called our redemption. And he brought us back into a relationship with God. And now we're going to move with him to the very end of history when the, the new heavens and the new earth are going to come down and everything's going to be made right. God and man and women will come back together man with man and, and man with his creation. And there's going to be this shalom and harmony where all of history is moving. And so this gospel can make you stand justified, where you can stand in the presence of God with all your sins forgiven and all of his righteousness put to your account, where he accepts you now as a child of God and brings you into his family. You're adopted. And then he begins to sanctify you, which means to grow you now and change your life, and start to transform it. And then it ends in this glorification where we're going to be made perfect. And there's going to be no more sin, no more devil, no more world tempting us. And it's going to be what's called paradise. And, and, and the hymn writer said, when you've been there 10,000 days, you'll have no less days to sing his praise than when you first begun. 10,000 from infinity equals infinity. Oh, what is laid up what Jesus Christ has done by coming to this earth and dying on a cross and being buried and being raised up on the third day. At the end of history, he'll make all things new and we'll be there and everything will be made right. I read this week from a preacher about J.R. Tolkien who uh, wrote Lord of the Rings and wrote, wrote a lot of great uh, fairy tales and different things. There, there's, a, there's a rescue, he said, at the end of all good fairy tales. And at the end of them, there's this gleam of joy breaks in. And he said, the gospels are the story with the essence of it all. This, this real world that's so broken is going to have a happy ending when Christ comes back. And every happy ending is pointing to that great day. And the happy ending for the Christian is because Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, bringing in the only thing that could give you a living hope this morning, forgiveness of sins and eternal life with Christ Jesus our Lord. So did it happen? Yes, it did. And what does it mean? There's a salvation that's being offered to you this morning. And God is asking you to repent from living your own way, your own thoughts about God, being your own God, kind of ruling your own ship. He's asking you to turn from that and to turn and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ who came in the world to die for your sins and to be raised so that you could stand righteous before God and accepted and beloved. 
Paul said that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. And so I pray afterwards, I'll be up here with two, a couple of the other pastors. And if you want to come talk about your soul and, and uh, the, the wake-up call this morning, if you want to come deal with eternal life of what God is offering, there's eternal life and eternal death in the balance. And I ask that you don't put this off and go eat ham and eat jelly beans and forget about it. I ask that you would deal with your soul this morning and don't leave this place till you know whether you have eternal life. And then believers, every year I ask you this question and it just gets deeper and deeper in my own heart. Is the resurrection the only thing that can explain your life? If you look at your life, the only way it makes sense to anyone else is that what drives everything is that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. It makes you sell everything and come to Colorado without a salary, not knowing anything. It makes you be willing to give up all things. And, and so it's, it's anything else can explain but the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's what drives my whole life. It's what I do, what I breathe, what I go after. Everything is about this Christ who's been raised from the dead. And so I just ask you on this beautiful resurrection morning, is that the only thing that can explain you? Or is it the Broncos? Or is it your IRA? Or is it your family? But what is it that can explain you this morning? And because he's risen, I I pray that that is the only explanation for your life. So did it happen? Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> what does it mean? The best news ever. And so I close. He is risen. He is risen. Louder. He's risen. Let's pray. Oh, Father, He is risen indeed. Lord, He was raised up for our justification. Thank you that He paid our debt, He bore the wrath for our sins. And now in him, there's salvation and no other name. God, thank you for the Lord, Jesus Christ. I pray that every heart would be overwhelmed in him and that he truly would be the explanation for our lives. I pray for those who have come in here and and do not know him. God, I pray this morning that you would open their eyes. You would give them uh, faith that they right now would look to Jesus Christ and they would put down their running and their fighting and they're resisting, and they would call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. And this very morning, they would know eternal life. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.